Um, this is the first of four interlinked sessions on the role of supply chain initiatives in um, reducing deforestation or something like that. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's uh, going to revolve a lot around zero, defore zero deforestation commitments and um, other implementation mechanisms for those commitments. So my uh, three of these sessions are research sessions, starting with this one. But the one after this is actually a round table with industry, uh, which should be really interesting so we can actually hear about whether what we're doing is relevant to them um, and whether we should be studying other things. So I have the first talk today. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in. And hopefully, nobody else has to explain what a zero deforestation commitment is after this. Um, so you guys are all keenly aware that commodity expansion is the leading driver of deforestation in the tropics. We have soybeans, oil palm, cattle ranching, et cetera. And as a result of this deforestation risk in supply chains, tons of major multinational companies are now making zero deforestation commitments, which are basically just public pledges to not source products from suppliers that have recently deforested their land. Uh, so what my work has looked at is first a paper on how effective these very recent commitments are likely to be, because there's not a lot of time to, uh, to understand how effective they already have been. Um, and then the next paper is going to look at the potential implementation mechanisms for these commitments and what the evidence base is that those implementation mechanisms have been effective. So this first paper is more theoretical. Um, so first what's really important is to actually define what we need by effective globally because we're all kind of conflating impacts and effectiveness, compliance, spillovers, additionality, and other definitions. So we met as a group of um, academics and practitioners and one industry representative to define what the highest bar of effectiveness is. And that's conserving forests in the regions where the policy is, is implemented without leading to greater um, conversion of native ecosystems elsewhere. So that starts with having compliant suppliers, um, so just meeting the rules of that policy. But then it also should lead to additionality. That's some outcome beyond business as usual. And then finally, um, the key criteria for global effectiveness is that it doesn't lead to spillovers to other actors, regions, or supply chains. Um, so basically, based on this framework and understanding of effectiveness, we developed a set of 11 criteria that were really focused on the stringency of the policy, the implementation scope, um, the context in which it's implemented, and then the market share of the collective implementation. We compared these criteria against the existing uh, commitments that are being tracked by Global Canopy, which is 250 companies. And this was as of the end of 2016. Um, that was the database we were using. So first of all, only 21% of companies uh, made real zero deforestation commitments. A lot of companies, you'll see really high numbers for forest policies, but they're not setting a definition of zero gross or zero net deforestation. So among those 52 commitments, there's actually very ambitious commitments. The stringency is very high. Um, and if it was implemented, that would actually be great. Uh, they set zero gross, um, more often than zero net targets. That means zero deforestation, actually, not just allowing for offsets uh, through reforestation. They're global in nature. They're multi-commodity. And they also extend responsibility more often than not to indirect suppliers. Um, but a big problem, sorry, that was, that graphic was, this graphics are messed up because I switched to a, a PDF. But anyway, um, for the third bullet, the commitment implementation scope is quite flawed. And so one of the biggest problems is that the implementation is not happening. They set some target in the future, and they've made this target public. So they're saying, okay, by 2020, or more often than not, 2020 will be zero deforestation. But uh, that allows for the opportunity to have preemptive clearing, which is very problematic. And then most of these are being implemented in regions um, that don't have the required geospatial monitoring capacities or other enforcement mechanisms. And then finally, the low market share is a major challenge. Collectively, these commodities, um, the companies that have made commitments account for less than 12% of the market. 
and uh, most of the implementation mechanisms are certifications. And at most, they cover 20% of the market, which is oil palm, RSPO. And at worst, they cover less than 2% um, for soybean production, for example. So then we looked at the evidence base for implementation mechanisms. Um, as I said, certification is most common. The other major mechanism to implement this commitment in a region is a market exclusion mechanism, saying I won't buy from you if you don't meet my rules. Um, and a certification is rather saying, hey, I've met these criteria. I'm certified. You will, uh, will you buy uh, from me because I've met these criteria? So they're slightly different, and they require uh, different um, domestic capacities for monitoring enforcement. And, um, and so we assessed all of this evidence, and there was actually only one case of a company code of conduct um, that's being used um, for monitoring deforestation. So uh, we did a systematic review in Web of Science of all studies that were related to deforestation um, that covered one of these implementation mechanisms and actually measured outcomes for conservation and or livelihood outcomes. And um, this was since 2000. We then coded the results that met our predefined inclusion criteria. That ended up with actually 49 papers, which was more than you might have expected, given how recent this is. And, um, and they studied some aspect of global effectiveness, so compliance, additionality, or spillovers. We coded them by the direction of the result, say negative versus positive additionality or no additionality, low compliance, high compliance, et cetera. Our confidence in the methods, inclusive of both qualitative and quantitative information, um, the highest level of confidence would be, say, for additionality, if you had a statistical analysis with a propensity score matching, very clear counterfactual there, but also additionally process tracing through semi-structured interview, for example, would be like the gold standard. Um, and then we coded these papers also by implementation context to try to start to understand, okay, where do they work and where don't they work? Um, so deforestation risk in the region, uh, farm response capacities, and then potential farm benefit. I'm open to more variable ideas at this point if people have suggestions. Um, then we did statistical analysis of the outcomes, um, which were basically bivariate regressions weighted by our confidence in the results. So these 49 papers turned into 71 cases of different country commodity mechanism pairs. You guys who are familiar with this literature know that it's heavily biased towards coffee certification in Latin America. And there's very little evidence on cocoa or oil palm, actually, comparatively, and very little evidence comparatively outside of Latin America. And there's also, we're also really important takeaway, we're measuring different things. So the people who are measuring market exclusion mechanisms are not measuring additionality well. They're mainly measuring compliance, and they're just saying effectiveness. And then the certification program uh, studies are very often rigorously measuring additionality, but then kind of overlooking compliance. So, uh, so that's, and then also the market exclusion mechanism um, studies are ignoring livelihood outcomes currently, whereas the certification studies are doing a better job of measuring those as well. So what we find is that most studies actually do find high compliance where it was studied, though it's often not studied. Um, and it was universal um, in the co coffee certifications, all coffee certifications in all countries. Um, and then there was pretty good compliance for all the other commodities as well. But again, oil palm here stands out uh, as having uh, numerous papers measuring incidences of, of deforestation and fires in certified plantations. There still might be additionality, but that's not necessarily compliance with a zero deforestation goal. Um, and then as far as additionality, we find that there's very few cases. Uh, there's less than 50% of the cases find that positive additionality of conservation impact beyond business as usual. And what happens though is there's a mixed bag of results between studies, um, and so there's, it's harder to actually draw inference about where this uh, works and where it doesn't, where there's additionality and where there's not. Um, and there was only one case in the entire literature where they both studied conservation and livelihoods and found a win-win, and that was for coffee certification, um, fair trade organic in eastern Uganda. So in terms of testing where these work and where they don't, what we found was that in terms of compliance, the regions where there are interestingly moderate conservation policies, so where there's some protection of the native ecosystem, but it's not super high and it's not zero, um, their compliance is higher in those regions. 
Um, the degree where the degree of commodity driven deforestation is lower, uh, there is there's higher compliance and where the level of market differentiation differentiation in the commodity supply chain is higher, there's more compliance. But um, this is heavily dependent on our small number of cases, right? So the conservation policy strength and the commodity driven deforestation are highly correlated. Um, and unfortunately, none of the contextual attributes currently explain differences in additionality across regions. So I'm looking for more variables that we can actually get between cases. We wanted to look at cooperative strength, um, the role of NGOs, and um, we also have several livelihood variables, but uh, it, we, it's not possible to get all those variables for each region and case. So in conclusion, um, current ZDCs are very unlikely to hit this bar of being globally effective because of their low implementation and low market share and problems of the implementation context. But that doesn't mean they're not gonna meet the individual company's goals. They're probably very likely to meet the goal of, um, of reducing or eliminating deforestation in an individual supply chain because the compliance levels are quite high with these implementation mechanisms. Um, but they're not going to lead to these broader conservation outcomes. Um, and we need to be looking more and studying more uh, on how compliance and additionality are dependent on contextual attributes, but what we seem to be some initial evidence that existing um, uh, public policies in those regions, which you'll hear about more from Eric, these public-private mixes, um, the level of deforestation threat and market differenti differentiation are clearly important factors. And despite the fact that we have four interlinked sessions and tons and people in other sessions, there still needs to be a lot more research on <laughs> particularly oil palm and cocoa. Um, but also just more research in general. So don't be discouraged if anybody says, oh, everybody's doing that, because uh, we need more data. Thank you. Right. Firm, firm level yep. Coding yep. 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 Um, that is, I think, an under-researched area, for sure. Um, we had one theoretical paper on that strategy that Jimena Rueda led. Um, it's in Journal of Cleaner Production. But as far as actual studies empirically measuring that, that has yet, I have yet to see it. But we do have a talk. Um, we have some people working on that. Um, Florian is presenting. Florian Galno is presenting research where the next stage of it will be understanding um, market share um, and the drivers. So what? So we're often studying how market share influences deforestation, but there's a selection bias there. So who selects into these commitments um, and getting at that? So yes, not yet is the answer. <laughs> Uh, that was mainly, we actually, in our initial white paper, which we have online through Meridian Institute, we have it in there. Um, we personally felt that the scope was enormous to begin with and that as co-authors, we collectively had the expertise to make uh, the inclusion criteria um, well for the food commodities. That was the main reason we felt like coding the livelihood um, in particular aspects in the timber and pulp, which we didn't understand as well, was too difficult, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I glossed over that. So um, the idea, the hypothesis is that where there's greater market differentiation, there's greater potential for a uh, price premium. So if there's no differentiation, say all oil palm um, is the same, or there's a difference maybe between sustainable oil palm and unsustainable oil palm broadly defined, but in coffee, there's a lot of differentiation that consumers actually care about and are willing to pay more for. So the higher that differentiation, the likely expected benefit is higher, and therefore you might expect compliance to be higher. Yeah, go ahead. 
Absolutely. So, yeah, we're very concerned in our research group about um, the potential bifurcation that can happen on the ground uh, among land users because such a small component of the market is going to consumers that care about these sustainability outcomes. So I think keeping that in mind, we have to be focused on what happens to the people who are left out and um, how their conservation behaviors change. So the spillovers dimension of this research, I didn't even present because there wasn't enough research. So that's where we need to be looking next, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will um, address the uh, question of scaling. How do you have an impact at scale with the supply chain initiatives that we are discussing in this session and in the next one? Let's start from a high level. The experts in what is known as theories of, theories of change do recognize that the very large complex problems can only be solved by a number of small solutions that are applied consistently over time. If you think about small solution, you are acting within the scale of competence of the actors. The local stakeholders can understand the nature of the solution. There's trust, less resistance. You implement these solutions within your social network, so there's some confidence in what's going on. And also, these small solutions can be fine-tuned to the local context. And also, they can be more easily monitored. There's quite a lot of evidence, not from our field, but from behavioral science, organization behavior, that small solutions is the way to transform very large, complex systems. And, and indeed, in, in talking about land use and deforestation, most of what's being applied, implemented, are indeed small solutions. Whether we talk about the government-led government -led interventions, or, or the small-scale sustainable intensification project, but also was the topic of this session and, and, and in others, you know, these, these voluntary sustainability standards. Whether we talk about eco-certification of just one commodity or market exclusion in just one jurisdiction, typically these qualify as rather small-scale solution. However, there's a problem. Small solutions tend to stay small. And, and we see that, you know, I think Nicola just mentioned that, the, the market shares of eco-certified products tend to plateau at 5 to 20% at best. And, and, and once they reach that threshold, all these programs really struggle to enroll more participants. You're just stuck there. And, and as one NGO put it, you know, if small is beautiful, but big is necessary. We need to have an impact at scale. If we need to transform the whole system. So how is this upscaling theme being addressed in this sector of technology and business? Well, there's one Bible, this book by Rogers, Diffusion of Innovation, 1962, but I think this is the fifth edition now. You know, he revised it slightly, but it's still a, 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 a big reference in that field. And the idea there is that uh, innovation are being upscaled by moving along this logistics curve here, but, but the Success in the upscaling or the rate of upscaling mostly depend on the attributes of the innovation. And identify these five attributes, let, let not go there, we don't have time, but it's really the characteristic of the innovation that will determine whether it goes through that, through that curve, whether it reaches 100% or 20% or whether it plateaus or whether it takes a century or, or, or 20 years to, to reach some scale. Another field that has been thinking a lot about uh, upscaling is the field of development. Development, poverty alleviation, and they have a very different approach. All this work on, on how to upscale intervention for development recognize that uh, all this scaling is done through, through channels, either through commercial markets, you know, once your innovation is being integrated to some market as a highly cost-efficient way to upscale, you, know, you just reach a very large number of potential users, or you upscale through integration of innovation into government policies. Governments are the institution 
that's best equipped to deliver new innovations on a very, very wide scale. My claim here is that for sustainability standards, it's a very similar situation to the one in development interventions, that uh, in order to create tipping point of adoption of the voluntary sustainability standards we're discussing in these sessions, either you need to work through public policies, integrating these standards into a public policy, I will give several examples, or you have to work through private companies that again integrate these standards as part of the code of conduct and all this internal code of conduct about sustainable sourcing. Let's look first at some uh, evidence relating to the first one, the role of government, first in producing countries. Quite interestingly, a number of countries, let's say Bolivia, who a few years ago said, well, we need to revise our forest code rather than reinvent from scratch and whole new forest code, let's just look at these five or six forest concessions that are being FSC certified for Stewardship Council. This is working well, this is very productive. Let's just integrate part of the FSC standard into a forest code. And now you move from something that's voluntary, adopted by five concessions, to something that's mandated by law and you have a huge upscaling. We find the same for the state of Minas Gerais in uh, Brazil. They copy-paste part of the UTS standard for coffee as part of their own uh, internal state government standard. Mozambique did the same with the Butter, Better Cotton Initiative that they applied as national regulation now for all the cotton producers. And we find other cases where it's not really managed by law, but uh, the uh, government provides incentives for concession holders that are certified. You know, you pay a lower, low, uh, a lower uh, yearly lease, or you get a longer concession contract if you adopt the FSC certification. So these are very strong vehicles for upscaling. Same with the role of governments in importing countries. We see a number of policies where um, um, uh, governments uh, 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 recognize or, or, or um, adopt uh, existing voluntary sustainability standards as providing evidence of due vigilance or due care, and, and, and through that mechanism, they do stimulate demand for products that are eco-certified, again, contributing to a very quick upscaling of these voluntary standards. A number of examples here, you know, the Fledge, they recognize FSC, PFC certification, US Lacey Act, the RED Directive uh, of the EU on renewable energy, and most recently, France duty of vigilance. Vigilance. What's quite interesting in these cases, uh, they are not generally accounted for in terms of impact effectiveness of certification system because they are just integrated public law, even though that's probably the channel through which they have the greatest impact, even though it's not recorded as such. We find the same for the private companies, where a number of private companies integrate as part of their internal codes of conduct these uh, voluntary sustainability standards. About more than 85% of the companies with a zero differentiation commitment have basically outsourced the uh, implementation of that commitment through adoption of existing third-party certification system. They just say, okay, I have this commitment. If you are RSPO certified, you qualify, you will, that will co contribute to the implementation of my commitment. Same with uh, uh, other form of uh, uh, certification. And, and, and these companies like Starbucks, IKEA, and, and many others who have made these sustainability commitments have indeed also just adopted these uh, standards. But again, they will not advertise that. No, they want you to buy IKEA because it's IKEA, not because it's FSC certified. So again, this is not recorded as part of the impact of certification. We took a random sample of 450 companies in OECD countries that are active in the food, wood, and textile companies. Uh, slightly more than half of them had adopted some sustainable sourcing practices, quite significant. And a third of these companies basically were implementing this commitment through external standards. 
third party uh, uh, standards. Quite significant, a third of these companies that made this commitment. They just say, we'll just rely on existing NGO-led or roundtable certification system in order to implement our uh, own uh, uh, impact. Again, a huge mechanism for upscaling these standards. So this is just pointing to the need to focus on the interaction between multiple policies that reinforce each other to have impact at scale, even though it's very difficult to document. And, and, and the way we typically conduct this research is to pick one instrument, one eco-certification system in one region, one commodity, study it, uh, and, and, and if it's an NGO-led certification, that's what we look at, but we generally fail to look at the interactions with other policies, whether they are public policies, company standards, NGO-led. But it's really the whole policy ecosystem that does lead to this impact at scale. It's because they tend to reinforce each other that you can really transform a system. And these forms of complementarity can work through different mechanisms. Now, the first one is the one I just uh, explained before, this uh, what I've called absorption. You know, one uh, a standard is just absorbed into an existing company or an, a, a public policy. Another one in the bottom is what I've called support and enable. So you have the voluntary standard but then the government plays a supporting role, creates all the enabling conditions that facilitate the adoption or the effectiveness of that, uh, uh, of that uh, um, uh, standard. In other case, there's a kind of division of tasks. You know, the standard provides an incentive for the leaders, for the most progressive actors in your market, but then the public policy is just raising the floor for the liars, you know, the people who stay behind and will not be responding to these market incentives. So you just pull from the top, you push from the bottom, and then you move the system in that way with very different type of intervention. And in other cases, these different actors will just divide the task. Some, either the NGO, the government, just set the agenda, define the standard, and the other uh, organization will say, well, we'll just take care of the implementation or of the monitoring, and together they, again, move the system. This form of collaboration between multiple actors is today being formalized by what we call jurisdictional approaches. So that's the new buzzword in that community. What is it? Well, that's the work that Marius van Hessen, Marius is sitting right there, has been doing recently. So this is a formalized collaboration between government entities, civil society actors, and all the private sectors. And they define practices, and these practices typically apply these policies apply to all the concerned actors within a jurisdiction, usually sub-national in most cases, except one. Okay, typically state, a province, etc. Marius has been developing a kind of typology of this um, uh, jurisdictional approach. So we have this graph, you know, this kind of donut shape. So everything that's wide is not a jurisdictional approach. So at the center, you have the more traditional government policies. Outside, you have the kind of more traditional form of private governance. NGO or, 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 or uh, commodity roundtables, private sector commitments, but anything in between that has some level of engagement of governments, NGOs, and civil society at different levels, high, medium, low, will qualify as a jurisdictional approach, provided that they really apply to a single jurisdiction with some very specific criteria. Looking at all the um, initiatives that do exist, we can uh, have this typology where some are typically focused on just a single community, you know, soy or coffee. Others in involve multiple commodities, you know, the interaction between soy and cattle, or even more commodities, leading to this kind of landscape approach, every commodity grown on that landscape. And others have a focus mostly on carbon stock. Let's keep the carbon in the uh, uh, land, in the forest. So we identify 72 projects that kind of advertise themselves as potentially being jurisdictional, Looking carefully at the definition, only 26 actually really qualify. Uh, actually, it's the other way around, right? 22 or 26. Remind me. <laughs> I, I think I'm mixing up. What a 20, 22 um, really qualify as jurisdictional approach. And, and they are spread out in that graph you know, quite nicely. Do We really cover all types of all categories of jurisdictional approach. OK, so what I said, I think I said four things. So first. Um, these sustainability standards, the way we implement them now is really by identifying the most progressive actors because it's voluntary, 
and, and just expecting these most progressive actors to adopt the most stringent standards. And we just leave the rest of the market alone. And so we basically have quite little impact because we only deal with the 22% or 25% of the market and the ones that are already most progressive. So if we want to provoke system-wide change, we need to think also about amplification mechanism. And as I've tried to argue and illustrate, these mostly work through interaction with public policies and companies' code of conduct, or these policy ecosystems I mentioned. Okay, so that's the concept of smart policy mixes or hybrid policies, which is quite central, I think, to achieve transformation using these uh, voluntary standards. Thank you very much. Questions? I think that's this model. You know, on one hand, you, you can provide these mechanisms to attract, incentivize the leaders, but you will always need for these illicit activities the more traditional command and control, threat of sanction, and just chasing these bad guys. Yeah. Well, no, you said illicit. That doesn't mean you know, the illicit, a lot of the illicit. I was in the first part of that session, and the illicit actors were the drug dealers, you know, the narco traffickers, and so these are not the small holders. These are the big, big uh, actors. <laughs> yeah, they provide the supply chain, but, uh, but uh, you know, these small holders could as well be integrated into, into a more formal market if, you know, if there's some, let's say, support from the state that will help this small holder to get into these opportunities. Yes, well, what happens in that case is that the NGOs or the bodies that create the standard typically just move to the new wave and try to define an even higher standard or deal with another issue that's more difficult to, to deal with. So they are quite happy, actually, to see that the uh, issue they've been campaigning for is being taken over by governments so they can focus on the more kind of cutting edge, whether it's slave labor or child labor or gender issues or something else, just to deal with these kind of more difficult issues at the uh, the pioneer, uh, as pioneers in that frontier of, of sustainability rather than just continue to do all the heavy work of, of bringing the whole market into the system. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Simon. I'm a PhD student at the University of Luang, supervised by Eric. Um, I'm going to talk today about coffee and sustainability efforts across the coffee sector, um, touching upon some of the uh, things that Rachel and Eric and also the question earlier 
uh, touched upon. Um, it says mapping, and actually I, uh, I intend to do a little bit more than that. Um, all of you know coffee. It's uh, one of the most uh, consumed commodities in the world. Um, about a billion uh, cups of coffee is drunk every day. Um, and I wanted to figure out beyond these uh, zero deforestation commitments that are very talked about in policy at the moment, what is actually going on in terms of addressing sustainability challenges in the coffee sector. So which efforts are undertaken by the companies engaged in this sector? And what factors explain or influence how these companies go towards that question of addressing sustainability? So um, I built upon um, a theoretical framework of the global value chain. I won't touch upon that a lot. A lot all of you probably know it, but the central part here being that coffee is a buyer-driven, a market-driven uh, value chain, meaning that the downstream companies, the relatively big actors, are the ones that drive a lot of the innovation in this chain. Um, I also touch upon stakeholder theory, which essentially started out with the Milton Friedman that famously said, the business of business is business, and it's since broadened quite a lot, that actually stakeholders are much more than just the immediate shareholders of a company. It's also the communities, the different actors in the supply chain. It's um, the consumers. Um, so this more broad view where any group or individual who affects or is affected by the achievement of the organization's objective is a stakeholder. So in that sense, sustainability governance becomes a response to stakeholder pressure. Um, to study this, I um, looked at the global coffee sector and tried to collect information about as many coffee companies as I could at all identify. And there are many, I should say. So I looked at a lot of different sources and came up with a list of about 4,000 companies that I then went through, cross-checked that I didn't have duplicates, that company names represented twice by um, being listed on stock exchange or having uh, subsidiaries in other countries, and ended up with 2,700 companies. From there, I took a sample of about a fifth of those, 550, and then I went through all of that information that these companies have, collect, have collected and presented through part of their communication efforts or sustainability uh, CSR work. So that's corporate reports, annual reports, and websites. Of course, the caveat here being that it's only the websites, the companies that have a web representation. I coded all that information that looks, that's an abstract of that, that looks a little bit like that. Um, what I collected information on um, is most of it is binary data. That means it's either yes or no. Either you do whatever I was looking for or you don't. Um, I looked at a number of sustainability practices, 21 environmental practices and 12 social practices. I also looked at a range of different certification practices. Here you can either be part of that practice or there was also a variable where you are exclusively doing that. That means that all your products are actually living up to that practice or that certification. I then collected a lot of information about the companies that are engaged here. Um, where are these companies located? Where do they operate? Is it a local market, a regional market, or a global market? Um, how big is the companies? I grouped them in five sizes from very small, meaning less than 10 people in the company, to very, very large, meaning more than 1,500. Um, I did that by employee size or employee number or by um, revenue. And then I looked at whether it's a business to business or business to consumer type of company. Um, I also looked at the company's position in the value chain, so going from the producers of the coffee all the way to the cafes serving the final product, not just as beans, but as coffee. Um, so what did I find out? Um, these are the environmental practices, and one of the messages that is quite central is that this is 25%. So even the most adopted sustainability practice across coffee sector is only adopted by slightly less than 20% of the companies. And a very central um, practice, especially given this, uh, this session, zero deforestation is adopted by something like 2.5% of the companies. Um, and actually what we see is that a lot of the practices that have a fairly high score, recycling, waste, um, energy use, um, they're not actually about, growing, about coffee itself. They're about something else related to the manufacturing of coffee. Whereas the only ones that really deal with, with uh, coffee is something like pesticide use, um, and uh, shade grown and tree plant, tree, <coughs> sorry, tree planting um, that actually deal with the actual practice of coffee itself. For the social ones, it's um, the most prevalent one is about 30%. That's giving donations, so that doesn't even have to do anything with the business itself. They just give away some money to do something. Um, and one of the more um, important ones in terms of coffee that research has shown is really important is child labor. And actually, only 10, 10 12% of companies in 
the global coffee sector, have a policy where they try to avoid having child labor, which was to me surprisingly low. Looking at it a different way, how many companies actually do anything at all? Um, one third of all companies in my sample does not adopt any sustainability practice whatsoever, which I think is a fairly surprisingly high number of companies because you have 20, 33 options and seven certifications to do something at all, and a third doesn't do anything at all. Um, then we have about two thirds of the companies that do, adopts at least one activity, and 40% adopts one to five different activities, which means we have about 25% that adopts more than five practices. I then um, went out to understand what characterizes these companies that adopt, I won't say a high number, but at least a comparatively high number of practices and that can thus be characterized as fairly sustainable. Um, so my variable here is adoption of sustainability practices. I did a logistic regression. Um, and what I can say about that is that the companies that are adopting a number of sustainability practices tend to be European or American. They tend to operate in market with, markets with high coffee consumption, so have consumers that are relatively aware of coffee as a product. They are large. Um, basically, the last two categories of my uh, fifth distinction of size is large and very large, so they're more than large. Um, they're listed on a stock exchange. They also, they are producers, or more importantly, probably have production facilities. Um, they are roasters, although that's not significant, but not cafes, and they're highly present on social media, meaning they engage in the community. Um, sorry, engage with their consumers. Another way of being sustainable, because here we're missing, uh, as you can see from the previous variables, we're missing a lot of the smaller actors. And then I thought, okay, so what about the companies what about the companies that do not rely on this hands-on government nance of doing something in their supply chain through adoption of practices, but instead adopt certification schemes for all of their products? It doesn't mean that they sell one bag of fair trade certified coffee. It means that all the products in that company have one form of certification, which is not the 4C industry certification due to its relative weakness, but fair trade, organic, rainforest, UT set, or the bird friendly certification. Um, those companies tend, I did the same variables, the 12 characteristics I showed you earlier. Those companies also tend to operate in markets with high coffee consumption, again showing the importance of the final consumer. However, they tend to be small. The important thing is they're small, but not too small. So they are not the very small companies with less than 10 people. They're the companies that have somewhere between 10 and 100 employees. So they have a relative market share and a relative consumer base and stakeholder base, but not at two small ones. They are, almost all of them, business to consumer companies. Um, they are producers, and that probably shows up as a variable because the producers that are certified to a certain characteristic, they will have that certification for all of their products most often. Um, and more importantly, they are not traders, so the companies engaged in trading of coffee across the supply chains, and again, they're not cafes. Cafes came out consistently as the very least engaged in sustainability efforts across the coffee supply chain. You can also look at this in a regional perspective with um, coffee having historically been looked at as in this north-south dichotomy um, where coffee was produced in the global south and consumed in the global north. But actually, I do not find that north-south distinction. The companies in Europe, North America, and Latin America look fairly alike in terms of adoption of practices. So this is the amount of companies that are adopting a, an average practice across the uh, supply chain. Whereas the coffee companies in Asia, Africa, and Oceania look more alike. And one could stipulate that it's not based on this north-south, but rather on the coffee culture of these different markets. Another way to look at it is by the size of the company which I already, from my regression analysis, showed that probably has some kind of influence on what you do. And here, um, it's relatively clear that smaller companies tend to have fewer practices in their supply chain than larger ones, and they also have a smaller tendency to adopt a code of conduct to address these sustainability practices. So with the regression and those two things in mind, one, my theory here on the theory that we're presenting is that 
very large companies or large companies tend to address their sustainability challenges through internal codes of conduct and engaging in their supply chain what you could call hands-on governance. They want to have control over their supply chain, so they dictate the practices that address sustainability, whereas the small companies do not have that leverage or that power, but they have an interest in addressing sustainability because of the pressure from their stakeholders, their consumers, so they do that through adoption of certifications. That being said, there has also been this tendency in coffee for a lot of the, uh, especially Western, uh, third wave coffee, uh, companies to engage in direct trade, meaning they trade directly with some of the producers of the coffee. Um, direct trade companies has, have been accused in literature of not being uh, very sustainable, so I compared the companies that engage in direct trade with the companies that do not engage in direct trade, and I actually found that direct trade companies adopt significantly more social practices than non-direct trade companies, and one of the most important things in there, and, and uh, potentially the reason that that shift to, to significant, is that they, they tend to pay a higher price for the coffee than non-direct companies. Um, thus, meaning the farmer earns more money, and that's also one of the, the issues that keeps coming up in, uh, in coffee. For the last, uh, second to last slide, I looked at some of the new trends in addressing sustainability, which goes beyond the, the hands-on governance through practices or the hands-off governance through certification. Um, and one of these things is providing transparency. Um, so about 3.9% of the companies um, are converting that. That's about 10 companies are what I would call radically transparent, disclosing all information about their supply chain, who the actors are. 2.5% um, provide full transparency on what they pay for the coffee to the different actors in their supply chain, either the traders or the producers. Um, for instance, in some of these uh, yearly reports. 12.5%, um, a slightly larger um, amount of these, provide information about the provenance of the coffee, so who grew the coffee, where does it come from. Um, and 5.5% provide some information about the, uh, the farmers that actually grew their coffee. That's, of course, part of some kind of storytelling consumer uh, engagement, but it also provides us with an ability to, to look at whether these companies are actually addressing sustainability in their production uh, areas. So, in conclusion, um, a very large, surprising to me, very large amount of companies do not communicate or undertake or adopt any form of sustainability practice. 40% of the others that actually do, do that through a, very, a number of very easy, um, most often non-coffee um, practices. 25% of the companies kind of, kind of lead the way through adoption of practices, either through hands-on or hands-off governance. But there are some key practices um, that have a very low adoption, deforestation commitments, child labor, climate adaptation. Um, adoption seems to be influenced by stakeholder pressure and value chain position. Again, the the region where you operate in, the size you have, the stakeholder base that affects your company's decision seems to affect how you go about conducting sustainability work. Um, and there are some new trends looking at the graph that Eric presented us with earlier of, of Rogers and innovation. There are, again, about 2.5%, 3%, these very early innovators um, that show us potential new directions in the work of sustainability um, in the coffee sector. That was it. That is, that is, do these, um, these practices that you listed, are they implemented? Well, the thing is, I can only, I can only quote what the companies say that they do and, and show that they do. So it's, it's, I, I didn't go and test that they actually did it on the ground. So this is, of course, another way of saying that there is a risk of greenwashing here, absolutely. Yeah. The other important thing about that is that it's a binary, I basically, it's, it's a quantitative measure of whether they do it right. I count whether they do it or not. I don't look at the quality of that practice. I mean, they might only implement that practice in one of their 10 producing sites, but I won't know because they're not disclosing that information to consumers. And that's a very important caveat, um, and that's something that you know further studies could look into. 
Um, but when you do a large sample, it's kind of. Oh, that's totally fine. I would just maybe change the word to policy rather okay. than practice yeah. and then discuss that maybe it's not enforced here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I was just wondering, um, a colleague of mine did once um, research, it was corporate social responsibility in, in Austria, which is probably quite far off, but um, what you presented was that it, the big companies that do sustainability um, things, and in, the, in this study in Austria what he found is that small companies, they, they are much more sustainable, much more friendly to their employees, much more engaged in the community, like they tick all, all the boxes, mm. but just they don't have a home page and they don't put it on it. Mm -hmm. And I think in like your presentation, like at least it left me with the impression, oh, you know, large companies are, are more sustainable because they, they do more things. But I think in reality, it's often the small companies that are much more sustainable per se in terms of, yeah, worker um, relationship, also embeddedness in the local community? I mean, I think there are two things that, I, thank you for your question, I think it's very relevant. Um, firstly, um, large companies are not necessarily sustainable. That's ab absolutely true, but I think it's also a misnomer to always say that small companies are sustainable and big companies are not, because big companies have the resources to actually undertake a lot of these efforts. Um, whether they want to do them and how good they do that is of course a question, but, but they actually do it. And, and one of the things I was surprised when I did this was because previous research has shown this, um, that small companies were supposed to be really good. And I would actually say that um, small companies, especially the very small ones, they have so few resources that they actually don't do anything at all. They might try to focus on one specific thing that they know they can do because their little consumer base does that. And rather, the companies that, that get the most, the, high, the company in my sample that has the highest count of practices and certification is a mid-sized company that has a very specific like philosophy. And that's basically an outlier in, in, in that sense because not all companies can do that. They cater to one specific market. So I think it's, it's not saying that big companies are sustainable, but they have the resources. So if their stakeholders demand it, they can actually undertake a lot of sustainability work. I did, um, and one of the things that was a problem here was that finding that information is super difficult. Um, listed, companies listed on stock exchange can be found, and that's why that's a variable. I could also, with some degree of confidence, identify um, the companies that were owned by these, you, those of you that know the coffee sector probably know that there are these five, 10 uh, roasting and trading houses that basically uh, own a lot of the, uh, the, the coffee world. And I identified also the companies that were owned by these companies. But then I have a big group of companies where ownership is unclear. It might be family owned, it might be some kind of businessman. And that, I just had so much uncertainty in identifying the last part of that group that I didn't want to include that as a, as a variable. But absolutely, it, it, it's worth looking at. Um, so my name is Florian Golno. I'm um, a postdoc at CSYNC and I'm working together with Rachel Garrett and Kimberly Carlson. Um, I will present um, some first work on um, exploring the potential conservation impacts of the audiophosphation commitments in the Brazilian Cerrado, um, which is um, at this point um, really explorative um, and we are working on um, improving or we are, we are working um, on um, you, um, impl implementing it at larger scales. Um, so um, I will basically skip that slide since we all know about the zero deforestation commitments. Um, yeah. <coughs> so what's most important, I think, is that like increasing number of zero deforestation commitments have been made, which reach up to four, 740 commitments in 2017. But um, what they actually change on the ground remains largely unknown. So key questions which we have actually have um, found out is. Um, the leakage, of course, um, which was the top theme of the last um, session in this room, but also how much of the market share is actually covered by zero deforestation commitments. As Rachel pointed out, currently very low amount of market share is covered. And how does market share influence the effectiveness of zero deforestation commitments? 
um, at what stage of market share can we actually assume that they reduce deforestation. Here I just pointed out um, the soybean exports from Brazil, which have actually a quite a high, large share of um, com um, soybeans um, exported under the eudophization commitments, um, with about 50% exported under a commitment, but only about 20% have an implementation mechanism of those commitments. While for the palm oil exports, these um, um, commitments are much lower, and that's most likely also why we don't, why we see less effectiveness of these commitments. So, um, while I'm working on understanding and modeling the effect of the market share, um, I have not yet finalized that anal analysis, and here I'm using um, explorative scenarios to evaluate um, the conservation impact. Um, the research questions I'm looking at is what is the potential conservation impact of the geodiversity commitments for reducing deforestation, conserving biodiversity, and above ground carbon, where I identify areas of potential synergies between um, these commitments and conservation and calculate potential conservation impacts if these targets were implemented promptly, so right now. I use data from Trace Earth, which we have seen in the session before. Um, I use um, above ground live OD biomass from Bacini et al mean species richness, and I use unprotected forests as um, um, an indicator of risk for forest loss. Um, we have seen part of this map already, um, how the um, zero deforestation commitments um, expanded throughout the Brazilian Amazon with the soil, mor uh, soil moratorium, and um, then uh, encroach or like, um, uh, were implemented in, in the Cerrado. Um, what is important that, like, in this in, while we have like about 90% of market share in the Amazon, which um, led to likely effectiveness um, for most of the soil moratorium, we only have about 40% um, of market share in the Cerrado, where we don't really know if there is really an effectiveness. Um, so we can actually think about it as a bit of um, uh, a function. Um, um, of deforestation outcome between market share and um, increasing with, um, inc with increasing market share having an increased effectiveness or re an increased deforestation reduction. Um, for my s analysis, I um, defined um, four different scenarios, uh, business as usual scenarios where like no implementation effects on no implementation of the zero deforestation commitments occurs, so deforestation continues as a business as usual um, scenario with a mean de deforestation of the la last five years. And then having a full effect of zero deforestation within those municipalities with, which have a 100% market share, um, a 75% market share, and a 50% market share. Why the 50% market share is rather an explorative um, analysis and where we can actually boost up potentially um, the conservation effects if more traders commit. Um, I combined those information on the market shares, but we can actually see that the um, distribution of market shares is much more um, variable across space um, with market shares up to 100% with some, in some municipalities. And combine these with unprotected forest, above ground carbon, soil deforestation, and mean marmal species. Um, on the x-axis, we can actually see the, the, the increasing the, 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 um, the zero deforestation market share, while on the epsilon axis, the quantile distribution of the conservation variables. In, um, in brownish colors, we see a synergistic effect um, where actually market shares are high and conservation um, values are high. So there might actually be the, um, these municipalities might, might be those which gain most of an implementation. But we also find in violet colors those areas where market shares are low, but um, bi um, biodiversity or conservation values are high. Um, moving, um, ah, so identifying um, those regions where we actually see these um, high market shares um, and high biodiversity values is mostly in the Mato people region as well, um, where there's um, on the one hand, ah, uh, yeah. Um, soil deforestation happening um, in areas where there's um, high market shares, but also um, soil, lots of soil deforestation happening in areas where there's 
um, low market shares, and when we look at unprotected forest, we also see municipalities which have a high market share and unprotected forest, but right next to it, municipalities which have a um, low market share and unprotected forest, um, call, um, having its um, an increasing risk of deforestation. Above ground carbon, um, we see a similar pattern um, with the Mata people region as well having synergi synergistic effects and also close to the um, Amazon biome, um, which we also see here in the mean marmal richness. So we can actually identify municipalities with different um, synergies um, across space. Looking at the pot potential conservation impact scenarios, um, I just um, wanted to highlight that if we um, implement um, or that we, if we assume a zero deflation effect, or uh, zero deflation commitment to be effective at 100%, we would have a 10% um, gain um, or reduced loss of soil deforestation, but even more um, loss of above ground, uh, reduced loss of above ground um, carbon loss and a re reduced biodiversity risk. Um, and that would even be multiplied if we um, um, assumed an effectiveness on the um, zero deflation commitments um, which only have a 50% market share at the moment. So scaling up, boosting up these market shares might be really effective in um, conserving biodiversity uh, and um, <coughs> which is of course important and we heard about a lot um, that these scenarios do not um, include um, leakage deforestation at this point and only include soil, soil deforestation. Um, for the conclusion, I just want to highlight that um, current commitments are located in high carbon and biodiversity rich regions. Um, so prompt in, in implementation can actually reduce deforestation and has, and has even larger effects on conserving bio, biomass and biodiversity. We can actually see for the implications that we can actually target, identify and target um, municipalities where companies source from with low deforestation, uh, with um, companies source from with low um, zero deforestation market shares, um, and um, pressure them for um, or like pressure them for um, sustainable sourcing strategies. If we scale up market shares, um, conservation effects could um, increase in, um, or double by about the amount which um, I um, showed before. And within my future work, um, I will focus on understanding what, um, the relation between the organization commitments and market share effectiveness. Um, also, especially looking at the Amazon biome where we have a large, um, um, la la much more um, evidence on effectiveness and larger market shares um, and implementation me mechanisms implemented. So this work is going to be scaled up um, for potential conservation effects of zero deforestation to larger areas using the dynamical modeling um, framework. And um, Rodrigo Riviero will going to give a flash talk tomorrow at 3, 3 p.m. Um, and I would like to thank my colleagues, um, Rodrigo, who's going to give the flash talk tomorrow. Um, and I would like to thank you for listening. Oh, well. what I'm going to use in my future. I have looked at it at this point um, and I have found um, a strong um, correlation within there, but I'm missing clearly important variables to explain this. Um, and that, yeah, these are going to be prepared and yeah. Um, that's certainly possible. Um, we didn't discuss that um, as much in the group yet. Um, um, above ground biomass is, I guess, the largest um, source which we, which we lose. Um, and the other sources are much, much more uncertain, much more dependent on what kind of land use is there, especially afterwards. Um, yeah. um, but a thing to discuss and to keep in mind, I think. Thank you. Okay.
So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jimena Rueda. Thank you so much for um, being here. Um, I have to make a disclaimer before I start my talk. Um, those of you who know my work, I usually do things on value chains and commodities. Um, but today I'm going to take a slight different um, ta uh, approach and going back, look not so much at the companies and the global uh, impacts of their actions, but at the um, land user and how the motivation that land users have land users have for um, deforestation can actually have an impact on, on the landscape. So the title of my talk is Beyond Proximate and Distal Causes of Land Use Change, Linking Individual Motivations to Deforestation in a Forest Frontier. And I did this work with Maria Alejandra Vélez and um, Lina Moros and Luz Rodriguez at both Los Andes and Universidad Javeriana in Bogotá. So the context is um, this, um, high post agreement uh, deforestation rates in Colombia, especially in the region of Caquetá, which was a stronghold of the FARC. And as soon as the agreement was signed, uh, or even in the preparation of the agreement a couple of years ago, um, deforestation rates started to grow up, to go up. So these are um, not comparable to the Amazon biome, but they're still pretty high for the country and especially for this region. Um, so we were doing this work in the context of a project funded by a Colombian NGO called uh, Patrimonio Natural, and they were funded by the USAID agency. And um, what they ask, was, were asking us to do was to design a payment for ecosystem services that had two considerations. One, um, that it was linked to value chains so that the payment could be sustainable over time and not dependent on a donor. And the second one, um, they were very concerned about the motivational crowding out. And motivational crowding out is this phenomenon in which uh, that has been described in the uh, microeconomic literature in which we are willing to do um, where is it? Sorry, here. We're willing to do work for free, a certain amount of work effort or put energy into something. As soon as we get paid for that same uh, effort, we might be able to, willing to do more. But if the, pay, if the payments are removed, then we end up doing less than we originally were willing to do. So that's something to take care into consideration where you are designing a policy that gives people incentives to change their behavior. Um, so again, we're working in Caquetá. This is a very large department in Colombia. We were in a very small place, um, the Rio Hacha watershed, but it's pretty, pretty significant for two reasons. First, it provides 70% of the water to the city of Florencia. Florencia is the largest city in the Colombian Amazon. It has more than 160,000 people, so it's bigger than Bern. And um, the, all the water is coming from <laughs> that place. Um, and the second important reason is that um, it's in an ecotone between the Andes and, um, and the Amazon. So it's the Andes foothills going into the Amazon basin, very rich in biodiversity and very important for the conservation um, of these ecosystem services. So our research question, question basically was, can motivations help explain deforestation behavior? Uh, and do people with high intrinsic motivations have less propensity to cut the forest than those, than those who have external motivations or not, motiv not motivations at all? And um, to do this work, we were basically adopting one of our, the seminal papers in our discipline um, from almost 20 years ago. <laughs> um, and actually looking at all the issues that matter for land use change, right? Like, or the drivers of land use change. So population pressures, demographics, uh, economic factors such as market growth, labor markets, land markets, and so forth. Technological factors that can affect um, the price and the cost of doing something or clearing the forest or introducing a new crop. Policy institutions and things like uh, property rights and presence of the government. And, but we are very interested in looking at these cultural behavioral factors that are in the corner of our discipline and very under research, I would argue, but are key to understand people's behavior. Um, so our second stream of literature comes from understanding motivations. Most of the, or Many of the theories and motivations 
assume that people either have intrinsic motivations or extrinsic motivations, and nothing in between. Um, so we found this, again, another classic, we're going back to <laughs> uh, research that has been done in the past, but it's quite significant. Uh, and this is um, by Deci and Brian. They proposed a continuum in motivations, that people have combinations of motivations. They're not only intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. And they go from those that are pretty internalized in our behavior and are part of who we are, to things that we do because we care about what others think of us, uh, to guilt motivations, which I think I don't need to explain. We have all <laughs> failed them. Uh, and more external motivations, either payments or punishments for what we do, to people who really don't care about a subject and would never do it even if they get paid to. Um, so we went into the field. Um, my other three collaborators are behavioral economists, and they did workshops and um, uh, experiments in the field, but we also conducted surveys with the farmers. And we tried to figure out what those motivations were to actual um, beha deforestation behavior. Um, one thing I would like to mention is that in the urban context, a lot of work has been done using motivations to explain behavior, why people recycle, why people save water. But in the rural context, I think that has been understudied. Anyway, so we went and did our four, uh, four point bipolar liquor scale, which are the ones that you mention a statement and you ask people whether they're in complete agreement or in complete disagreement in a scale from one to four. Uh, we presented the statement in the same order and I can talk afterwards more um, on what, what does it mean to do it that way um, for um, um, methodological consistency. Then uh, we spread the statements throughout the whole uh, survey to make sure that people couldn't relate to the previous question, to how they answered the previous question, but it was you know, among a survey of two hours, they were spread out. Um, and we run our logistic regression to try to explain whether they have cut the forest or not and how motivations affected that decision. Mm, and we included all the economic variables linked to you know, household dynamics that might explain um, deforestation. So we run several models. We wanted to test each one of these motivations, but we were also asked by the reviewers to do it in a conjunct way. So we also did that for those that were uncorrelated. So these are the type of statements that, you, that we presented farmers with. Things like, I enjoy when I do not clear the forest. I see my, myself as someone who doesn't clear the forest. I will regret if I clear the forest. Uh, people be, we cri will criticize me if I do it. Um, all the way to, um, I do not cut the forest because of fear of fines, or I do not see myself, I do not see what I can gel, get from protecting the forest. There is no point in doing so. Um, when I present this work, people usually ask me, what type of forest dwellers are you talking about? And these are not people who really depend on the forest traditionally. These are farmers who have been expelled from the um, agricultural mainlands in, in the middle of the country in a process of dispossession and violence that has taken more than 50 years, and they come into this agricultural frontier to do what they used to do in their previous land to grow crops. Um, so that's uh, a, characteri a general characterization of our farmers. Um, we have, uh, here's a comparison of the households who have cut the forest and those who have not. As you can see, we have a very small sample, and I will talk about that uh, more at, towards the end. But basically what I want to show with this graph is that they are pretty similar. We're not talking about very large households compared to small households, or very large farms compared to small farms. There are only a few characteristics that make them different. The size of the farm is still slightly uh, higher for those who cut the forest. Um, the distance to the nearest road is a little bit higher as well. They are all engage, or most of them engage in sugarcane and cattle ranching. They have been living in the farm for a longer period of time than the non, those that would not the forest. But for many of, of the other um, socioeconomic variables that we use to explain deforestation behavior, they're pretty similar. So these are the models that we run for each one of the different um, um, motivations. And I will just point out two things. The first one is, is that sugar cane consistently shows to be a very strong explanatory variable of deforestation behavior. 
Um, and the reason for this, I think, is that sugarcane provides a very easy, low investment first crop to grow when you get into the forest frontier. So they clear the forest, they plant um, the grass, basically. It's a perennial crop. You cut it every four months and obtain a, um, an income uh, in a, with a transformation that is really easy. It's easily done, it's easily done um, regionally. And you produce these blocks of sugar, which are the basis of the sugar uh, consumption for most peasants around Colombia, and you can store them and you can sell them in the market and so forth. So it's a really good cash crop that uh, people can uh, grow with very little investment. And then to our, to our um, um, motivations issue. So we find that intrinsic motivation are, motivations are highly and negatively correlated to deforestation behavior. So people who have intrinsic motivations tend to cut the forest less than those who don't. The other one we found that is uh, highly significant is amotivated people. So those who declare themselves to be amotivated cut more forests than those who don't. Um, and then the other interesting, uh, and, and then external motivations are significant, but only if there are payments. So people don't respond to the threat of fines or to the social motivations. They really don't care about what other people in the community think. And we think that this behavior is related to the fact that they're coming from very different regions. They don't have kinship relationships, they're not, they don't come from the same ethnicity or the same community, they're coming from all over the country with very uh, weak links among themselves. So, um, just for the discussion, I think the, the main point I already made, motivational factors can explain difference in self-reported deforestation, even when households have the same Bios, biophysical conditions and uh, socioeconomic conditions. So I think what the relevance of this work is that it's giving importance to agency back again. That people even in these dire conditions of being in a forest frontier, not having any income, not being the owners of the land as many of them are not, um, they still have reasons in themselves to halt them or stop them from cutting the forest. Um, so these intrinsic motivations prevent deforestation, social motivations and guilt did not explain the report to deforestation, neither the threat of fines. So now to the limits of the limitations of, of this work. When I talk about this, I, I always say it's very ambitious in its intent, but very modest in its achievements. We have a very small sample, uh, only 60 something households. Uh, we're, used, we're not really establishing causality. We weren't there with them when they, when they arrived into the forest frontier. So we're asking these questions after the fact. Is self-reported deforestation? We didn't actually go and measure it, although we do have the data, the data points. So if somebody's interested, we can build those uh, databases and figure out how the land use has been and since they arrived. Um, they might be creating a consistent narrative, like we all do with our behavior, right? But so the narrative is consistent to what, whatever you end up doing, even if at the beginning you weren't thinking that that was your reason. And there's more samples. Mm. So just to conclude, our funders were right in their fear for the motivational crowding out. Because we are really highlighting the importance of motivation in when you design or implement or even evaluate uh, the effects of policies that intend to change behavior. So if it's true that these people were internally motivated, what would happen when we introduce the payment for ecosystem services? And what would happen when we remove that policy? Um, so I think you know, it's, it's opening a field that has been explored very little in the land change literature and is the one of motivation, individual motivation. Um, when we need to move beyond self-reported to actual behavior in order to um, establish causality. Um, and finally, motivations can really play a very important role in uh, changing behavior, especially in forest frontiers, where these command and control strategies are more difficult to implement because the government has been absent and is still absent after uh, more than 200 years. So people do have reasons in themselves that can help them change their behavior and we can, in a way, harness those motivations uh, for the implementation of, of policies to uh, stop deforestation. Um, since the since I presented this proposal to this, uh, um, to this session, the paper was written and published. So you can uh, read it, it's on ecology and society and an special issue on Latin America that, was, um, that came out uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and 
thanks to our funders. And thank you so much. Do it or you yeah. I don't know the answer for sure. I, I would tend to believe that depending on your, the moment of your life, your motivations might change, right? But what is interesting is that we are talking to them 10 to 15 years later after they've been in the forest, and we ask these two questions in separate moments. Did you cut the forest was asked and at a workshop, and the survey was asked at a different time. And, um, and the, all these questions are spread out through the survey, these are statements that they related to, and the responses are consistent. So it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, th there might be some households that just arrived seven months ago, there might be households that have been there for four years, and then still we find the correlation in, in, you know, in not cutting the forest, uh, being associated with having a strong intrinsic motivations. So, we don't have the same households through time, but we have a picture of different households at different moments of their lifetime. Yes, Robert. I was really, I'm really interested in this idea of crowding out, and for me, actually, what I'm more worried about is the crowding out that might happen from targeting. So, as an economist, I would immediately think that you would use this motivational data to find the household that's most extrinsically motivated, that's going to chop down the forest without payments, but will change their behavior with the payments, and you target them. But if you do that, you create a more extrinsically motivated community where their motivations change. And I'm curious whether you looked at that at all, whether that's something that the funders are thinking about, because I know USAID, they're interested in that kind of targeting of payments. How do you structure policies where you get the additionality, mm -hmm. but you're avoiding mm -hmm. that kind of inequity and crowding out? So in the, in the final design, what we did was to, first of all, divide them by the size of, their, of the farm, because the opportunity cost of a small holder of one hectare in conservation is much larger than one that has 200. So, so we separated them, we, we recommended to the, to the funders that they'll separate them by size. And then we also asked them whether they would prefer a collective payment or an individual payment. Um, and they, they all wanted an individual payment. So <laughs> the, the way we, the way we uh, structured that was to link the payment to improvements in the coffee quality because they all grow also ex excellent coffee th from this region and there's a lot of interest because it's the, the coming from this um, uh, peace, strong or flagship place, Nespresso and Starbucks, they all have expressed interest in buying coffee from the region. So that was, um, that, that was uh, another issue. Uh, so we were thinking if, in, if we can improve the productivity of the coffee at the same time keeping the commitments, that's a way in which uh, we can have, uh, have it both ways. So pay the pay, do the payment, but also a payment that is more sustainable over time. Um, but that's, I'm not answering your question yet. <laughs> um, and then the, the last thing we, we, we um, did was try to figure out who should get there first, but more for the um, risk of conversion of the place, not so much the motivations. So are they in critical places that are high risk of deforestation or that are key for connectivity? Um, but we didn't look at the issue of, of whether we should target those that are not motivated or that could could be only externally motivated. We didn't go into that. Martin. 
that's, it's very interesting, the question. Unfortunately, they haven't put the project into, um, into practice, so we can follow up with those questions. But we did see that when, when Eric and I did the work on, on coffee, that actually coffee farmers tend to become like an icon in their communities and, and uh, somebody to, they, they take pride on what they do and people start imitating their behavior even if they don't become certified. So definitely there's probably a, a positive side on this one, <laughs> not just losing the, the, the intrinsic motivation. So, oh, yes, please go ahead. Oh, no, that's a very good question. Probably the forest was already cut when they arrived. So this is at their time of arrival. So they had some land in, from which they lived. So is there a difference between, you know, um, how, much, uh, how much agricultural land there is on their, on their land already? In, in web, you know, yes. When they had cut a little bit. So because the farms that cut the forest are a little bit bigger, they have a little bit more forest as well. Um, but this, they are the ones that are that cut more when they arrived. Um, and, and the others are smaller and they already had that land cut out. 